Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, it's cold out there. <laughs> it is cold out there. But trust me, it's going to be just fine today. In fact, I'm going to nice. We're going to have a we're going to have a real nice session, a nice chat with someone that uh, I've uh, I've come across, and uh, and I'm really appreciative of the fact that he's going to be here on the show today. And you're going to be finding you're going to find it very interesting, like I found it very interesting, especially after I read this article and that Jeff Mapes puts to, put together. And basically, he was talking to he did an overview, or uh, if not that, an interview with the new state chair of the Republican Party, a gentleman by the name of Art Robinson. I got so excited about the article that I invited the gentleman to, to meet with him. We chatted a bit, and next thing I know, he's, he drives five or six hours just to come out and meet me. And we sit down and we chatted for, for a moment and whatever. And you know what? The guy just almost just sounded just like an Oregonian. It sounded like a good American and, and issues and economics and education all the things that I've been talking to you about for years here, here on the Oregon Voters Digest. So anyway, we're fortunate not only just to have the chair of the, of the, um, of the Republican Party for the state of Oregon, but a, but a true American, you know, uh, I mean, just go right down the line, very refreshing person or whatever. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going on an interview. Art, how are you doing? Okay, how are you? Welcome to the Oregon Voters well, thank Digest. Thank you. It's a privilege to be on your program. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, look, Art. You know, before we get into the politics of the matter, yeah. the first thing I want to do, I want to, I want to share with my viewing audience uh, just who is Art Robinson, okay? <laughs> well, you know, let's do that. What about, how'd you get here? Is this, is this well, Oregon I'm, your home? Or yeah, well, no, I, I uh, came to the West Coast to go to college. I went to Caltech. I'm a scientist, okay. I'm a biochemist. And I, con I, I work on biochemistry, and I work on the development of new tools for medical diagnosis, for the diagnosis of disease. And we have a research laboratory in Southern Oregon called the Oregon Institute of Science and what Medicine. What does diagnose disease? What does that mean? What, what, uh, break means it you, down for you us. Want, you don't feel good. What's wrong with you? Okay. And there are very advanced techniques you can use in chemistry, which we work on in order to de determine the health of a person, what's wrong with them, faster and more effectively. How so, long have you been doing this? I've been doing that for 40 years. 40 years? Yeah. Wow, and you started up in California, I guess? I started, in school, we right? started in California after I got out of school. I used to be on the faculty of UC San Diego. Oh, really? And then uh, started a research institute with my friend Linus Pauling. And who was he? He was a great chemist uh, from Caltech and also worked on medical things. So we worked together with that for a long time. And then when we came to Oregon 33 years ago, my wife and I and some of our colleagues started a research laboratory in Southern So Oregon. she was a scientist, too, in her own She rights. was also a scientist. And then I also... Uh, I've done a few unusual things. During the Cold War, I worked on civil defense, uh, protection of people from the effects of war. I've worked on the issue of human-caused global warming, uh, pointing out that the science is not consistent with really? the, the propaganda. You, know, you mentioned something else in that discussion about yeah. sickle cell. Sickle oh, cell. yeah. Well, that's, what, what was that? That was the first uh, molecular disease discovered. It was discovered by people I worked with at Caltech uh, earlier than I worked with them. Uh, Sickle cell anemia is a disease of the hemoglobin molecule. It's genetic. One amino acid is changed. Hmm. And this causes the red blood cells to crystallize, and the cell is distorted. And then the cells can't get down the, uh, the capillaries. So that's where that sickle thing comes in. And it's called sickle cell anemia. The reason it became so prevalent is that although one force, if you have both genes for sickle cell mm -hmm. anemia, you're very ill, and you usually don't live a long life. But if you have one of the two genes, you're immune from malaria. Hmm. So especially in Africa and other malaria-prone regions, people, even though uh, a parents, if, if each parent carried one half, one sickle cell gene, a fourth of their children would die at an early age, a half of them would be immune from malaria. Hmm. And malaria was such a scourge that this kept the disease in the population. Hmm. And it was discovered at Caltech in the 50s that uh, it's the, the reason for it, that it's the hemoglobin molecule undergoes a slight change, the molecule that carries oxygen in the blood. But it was the first genetic disease truly understood hmm. and very important in uh, biochemistry. Are, you still, are we still experimenting within that area? We're still experimenting. The, the diagnosis is, uh, is easy. 
but it is a little expensive. So the kind of things we do could make the diagnosis less expensive. Oh, really? That you're doing now? Yeah. Anything. Our work is to drive down the cost of diagnosis so it can be so cheap that people don't have to really be sick to go and see how their health is. Mm -hmm. That they can they can do it inexpensively, but. Uh, also, the therapeutic advances in sickle cell anemia still go on. You can't change the genetics, but you can ameliorate the symptoms. And so people with the disease live longer and longer as a result of what's learned about how to deal with their, their problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, and when, I, when I think about it, the reason why I asked you about that is here within the metropolitan area, they tend to identify that uh, a greater number of the population are African Americans. Yeah. And you, you're constantly hearing the whole issue yes. of sickle cell. This is because they lived in tropical regions okay. where malaria was prevalent. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in Africa, where Albert Schweitzer was, for example, virtually everyone at the hospital, including the doctors and nurses, had malaria. Mm -hmm. Malaria is endemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, now malaria was eradicated in the United States with DDT and almost eradicated in other parts of the world until there, there was an environmental... Uh, program against DDT and now malaria has risen mm -hmm. again. But it's a, a special scourge in the regions of Africa. It's an African American. And, that's that, and, and that is the reason that it is prevalent in the African American population because it had made them immune to malaria, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. even though they got the sickle cell You disease. mentioned the fact that you were doing, in fact, you were doing, i.e., sort of urine sampling, if you will, of, of various diseases. Yeah, we're, we, we now, uh, the diagnostic medicine is the kind of thing we do. Yeah. Uh, we now can take your urine sample and mm -hmm. measure 5,000 chemicals in it quantitatively in a few seconds. Wow. And those 5,000 substances are mostly produced by your body in the process of living. They're mm -hmm. small molecules mm -hmm. that you require for life. If you measure 5,000 of them in a urine sample, you can pretty well tell what your health is. Really? And tell about uh, uh, your how old, how old you are physiologically, what diseases you're likely to obtain. Right now, we're, uh, we're making it practical. We've worked for many, many years on the analytical methods. Now we're calibrating them. Hmm. And to calibrate them, we're collecting urine samples from thousands of people, storing them cryogenically, and then measuring them and correlating them with their health. Mm -hmm. After this job is done, this kind of technology will be available to ordinary people. Hmm. Now, could you, again, here I am going back to this sickle cell, that's how we started this conversation. Is, is, is there still further studies that one would, might be identified? Could you identify the, those well, elements I, within? I'm sure that uh, the kind of thing we do, or the right. people in our field, okay. will make it easier to diagnose. Okay. And it will also make it easier to sell, see if therapy is working. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you have a measure of health, you 5,000 substances in your metabolism, you really know what your health right, is. Right. If you have a quantitative measure of your health, then you can change the conditions of life, the therapy, the sickle cell patient or mm -hmm. any other patient mm -hmm. is undergoing, and with something that can put a number on their health, mm -hmm. as you make a change in, in therapy, mm -hmm. it will change either better or worse. Once you have a measurement, you can modulate the therapy more intelligently. Okay. Instead of a guy coming in with cancer and you say, well, it's too bad you got it, take this drug, we'll see if you live. <laughs> you say, take the drug and we'll measure you every day to see how you're doing. Uh, and that means that if the drug is helping, you would see the cancer recede. Right. And if it's hurting, it would go, mm -hmm. it might not recede and you'd have time to try something else. Mm -hmm. So in sickle cell anemia, for example, there are, and I'm not up on all the therapies for it, but there are a number of therapies if you have a quantitative measurement of the disease, mm -hmm. other than the guy saying, well, I felt worse or better, which is not very quantitative, mm -hmm. if you have a way of putting number on the severity of the disease, then you can try different therapies and see objectively how they're doing. You don't have to wait a year and have the guy's health deteriorate terribly to know whether the therapy's working. You can find mm -hmm. out quickly. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that our work's directed toward is trying to measure illness quantitatively mm -hmm. so that therapeutic methods can be more effective. Okay, good. And who, the, who is this information for? Uh, we, we're a nonprofit research laboratory, okay. so like university labs, we publish everything in the open literature. So anything that we discover, we publish in the literature for everyone. There are no patents or, or rights to anything we do. And, and, and then anyone can pick it up and commercialize it. So CDC, people like the CDC can... 
Anybody can use it. Anybody yeah. can use that aspect. So of it. it's a lot of science develops that way, especially right. okay. basic research in the universities. Mm -hmm. And if you publish in the open literature, you give up all commercial rights, mm -hmm. but the literature is read all over the world, so whatever you discover is more important because it's used more widely. Oh, that's interesting, interesting. Well, now, I take it, and that's another thing that I was so excited about art here, as you see, I'm, I'm going down this direction, that um, uh, you're open for urine samples, right? Across the well, board? Well, right now, for that you, you're, How you you're, doing? you're, you're, uh, Viewers may eventually get a, a request from us. Was oh, that right? Okay. Yeah, we, we recently sent a, a, a request to everyone in Josephine County. Good, okay. And we'll be sending some other counties. And before we're done, we probably will have sent a flyer uh, asking people to participate in our sure. project, okay. Everybody in Oregon. Oh, great, great, great. But that will take, that'll be done over the next year or so. Okay, good. Well, well there you hear it. Hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll, we've got that information. So when you get a, a, a request for a urine sample from okay. us, okay. you'll know why. You, is there a website that one can go to? And uh, well, you can go to the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine website. But okay. you don't go there to sign up to participate, right. although you could. Right. I think the flyer's on there, and you're right. welcome to participate if you want to sign Okay, so it's it's on that website. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. And how's it named? How's That's oism.org. Okay. okay uh, Oregon good. Institute of Science okay. and Medicine. And it would denote, i.e., urine sample and. Well, then the, you'd see the project. You see the project on there. Okay. And you'd see a flyer about it. You see the flyer we're sending out. That sounds good. Okay. Well, you see, folks, that, that that article that I read in Oregonian was very interesting. That's why I, I sort of targeted that particular aspect. There was another area that I was very interested in, yeah. and the whole issue of the fact that. Um, your wife, I guess, had passed away, yeah. and you talked about the, the education of your kids, the homeschool. Yeah, we talk about that. What? Well, I have six. Well, they're young people now; yeah, they're right, not right. children anymore. But uh, my wife and I had six children. She was a scientist, also. We worked together here in Oregon. You had them all. Yeah, and well, we born two were born before we came here. Okay. No, three before we came okay. here. Okay, and she was homeschooling them, mm -hmm. but she died when they were ages one and a half to twelve. So I had to continue the education, mm -hmm. but I had to also make a living. Mm -hmm. So we uh, kept our homeschool going, but without a teacher. Uh, it was uh, it's self-taught, and this worked very well for us, it's remarkably well. So uh, people advised us to make it possible for others. So my uh, when they were truly children, they scanned all of the books and materials they used for their education onto 22 CD-ROMs started selling it, and 60,000 homeschool students now use their curriculum. Hmm. And that's the way the children work their way through college, hmm. Hmm. selling homeschool curriculum. If I were to ask you, I'm sure being a, being a scientist that you were, you, you probably did your, you did your homework in regards hmm. to even public schools. Yeah. And, I, and, and, and But the bottom line, if I were to ask you, uh, were you, were you did you research that aspect of it? And did, well, did yes. you look at those options in terms oh, yes. of going to public we, schools? We did, and, so? and, and the, uh, I must say, American public schools uh, historically were truly excellent. Mm -hmm. When I went to the schools 50 years ago, American public schools were the best in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a great education that got me into Caltech, and I've had a wonderful life in science, which I owe initially to those public schools. Mm -hmm. But over the last 50 years, we've had the encroachment of the public employee unions, uh, the state government, the federal government, and they've taken control of our schools away from our local people. Mm -hmm. And when they were locally controlled, the competition between the localities and the school districts and the, all of the resources being allocated by people who knew the students, they, they were part of the local community. When the local community controlled the schools, we had the best schools in the world. Mm -hmm. Now that local control has been ceded to big government and big unions. And the result is the United States is about 20th in the world, and it's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And also we have tremendous heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. In our country, some schools are still good, but in many of the less affluent sections, our schools are really mm -hmm. very, very poor. And this injures a student for life, because if he doesn't learn basic skills, then he has trouble in life. Mm -hmm. He can be very, very smart, mm -hmm. brilliant, but without uh, a fundamental academic education mm -hmm. and math and reading, you know, and, mm -hmm. and simple things. Uh, you're hurt in life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you plan to do. Uh, good education is good oh, for everyone. Oh, very much so. so. So as a result of the homeschool, so the, the, your, was your the homeschool movement okay. uh, only has about three million people in it. Mm. There was no such thing when I went to school, mm -hmm. and there shouldn't be any need for it. Mm -hmm. But with the public schools being taken away from local control and the quality going down, uh, more and more people want to educate their children at home because the schools aren't doing the job.
Mm -hmm. And we definitely have an issue right here in the Portland metropolitan area. Oh, that. yes. And in Portland, uh, the average uh, educational uh, cost of a student is $10,000 per year. Mm -hmm. In Portland, it's 14000 mm -hmm. And the uh, only far less than half, probably a third of that money actually goes to the classroom. Mm -hmm. All the rest goes to special interests that have their money, their hands in the money. So uh, one of the reasons they've deteriorated is that as state and federal government and, and these public employee unions got control of the schools, then the special interests got the money. Mm. So, I mean, if, for example, the average across the country is 10,000 per student. So in a 30 student classroom, that's $300,000. Mm. But if you think the classroom with 30 students anywhere in the state is getting three hundred thousand dollars to teach with, so you're crazy. You know, the, the teacher uh, is paid only a tiny fraction of that, and only maybe a hundred thousand of the three hundred thousand reaches that classroom, mm -hmm. and the rest goes to special interests. And those special interests generally screw up the education mm -hmm. because they tell the teachers what to do when the teachers are trying to do their job. Good, good, good point. So I'm I'm a I'm a, a the public schools in the United States for couple of centuries basically mm -hmm. were the best in the world but they were run by the local people the parents the PTAs the local people who were concerned about the education making sure of their the money got into the classroom yeah and they and, and the they also were concerned about their students because mm -hmm. they were local mm -hmm. and they competed with other local school mm -hmm. districts mm -hmm. it's this taking the schools away from local control that is our problem and we need to fix it okay okay now let's go back to your school your home school what yeah. was the results of your homeschool with the, with the kids? Oh, it was, it was truly excellent. They, uh, four of them have doctoral degrees, and two are still working on it. What was that again? Uh, four, four, four of my six children have doctorates now, and two of them are still working on those degrees. And uh, three of them were in college only two years because they skipped two years of college uh, because they learned a lot more in their homeschool than they would have in a public school. It's my understanding you, you wrote some of that curriculum, too, for them, right? Well, we worked yeah. on it together. You worked on it? Yeah. yeah. This was with whom? You, you and your wife, you mean? No, she was gone. Okay, uh, she was gone. The reason okay. we developed the, the self-teaching homeschool curriculum is because she was gone and mm -hmm. we didn't have a teacher. Mm -hmm. I see. In most homeschools, the mother serves as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I see. But we didn't have one. And this, uh, the curriculum is especially popular because uh, a lot of people like uh, single parents uh, who have to work, they can't be a teacher. They don't have a second parent. Mm -hmm. And those people uh, can educate their children because they don't have to help them. The curriculum's laid out so the child learns by himself. Mm -hmm. Is my understanding some of the cohorts are happen to be some of the kids or some of the grown men now? Yeah, yeah, well, all of them. How many are working, working with you in the, in the, in the Well, all of us research. work together from one way or another. Uh, we have still the seven of us, my six children and I work together. But they also have things in their own right. Two of them are veterinarians. Uh, one's a chemist, one's a nuclear engineer. Wow. And they're, but uh, well, we all work together. Wow, wow. Well, now, let's come up. Now we're getting ready to get into the politics of this. Okay, thing. well, now. All right. I'm, now, now I'm how did be you, in trouble when, when did you're you a first, smart politician. No, by no means. I'm very low key. I, I'm uh, a scientist who just uh, fell into politics because I wanted to, to try to help, help a little. How did that happen? You yeah, yeah. know about politics. <laughs> how did that happen, Art? Well, uh, just an accident. My sons and I went to a town hall meeting that Peter DeFazio held. Okay. And we you, just curiosity? Or? Yeah, I've forgotten why we went to the okay, meeting. It okay. was just downtown in Cave Junction. And uh, we came home shaking our heads, saying that that can't be our congressman. Now, Peter, Peter, he's a congressman, right? He's a congressman from District 4. District 4, okay. And he's a big government man. Okay. But we, uh, we didn't like what we saw. But there was a good Republican running against him, and we thought, that's great. We hope that he'll lose. Yeah, right. But that man dropped out of the race at the last minute, and my sons and I sat down and said, well, why don't we try it? Yeah. We didn't know what we were getting into, but we ran against him, and we did pretty well, and we're still running against him. We we're trying to beat him. Now, it's my understanding you'd, you'd run several times before that. We ran twice. You ran twice yeah. against DeFazio. DeFazio. Okay, that's so the, the only thing we've ever done. That's the first time. Then the, sec the first time you ran, right? I, I, yeah. How did you end up? What, what, what uh, I got 44 percent. 44 percent? Yeah. First time? First time. Well, you've never run for dog catcher or anything no, like that? No, no, nothing. That was as no, it? That's no. it. Now, the second time you're running, well, what, the second what, time, was that was uh, last time. Okay. And the presidential race right. and the uh, remarkable showing of, of Mr. Obama, you know, got right, a huge right. vote. 
that diminished all the Republican votes. So we got 10,000 more votes in 2012, but we got a lower percentage because mm. of the fact that it was a presidential year and the Democrats were doing so there well. There were some other little things about that particular time that uh, I guess one of the sons had run. Oh, that was another followed. thing. Yeah, one day my, my youngest son, Matthew, who was 26, came in. He says, uh, I think I'll change my registration against run against DeFazio in his primary. And uh, we, it was his thing. We said, really? And he said, yeah, I'm going to do this. So he did it. And it was remarkable. Uh, he, DeFazio hadn't had opposition in his primary for 20 years. Def uh, Matthew got 20% of the Democrats in our, in our county, 10 across the district. And uh, did exceptionally well. Because you see, the political issues, they're not Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. They're uh, American values and which politicians, mm -hmm. individuals, not parties, but which people will best represent us and maintain our freedom and maintain our prosperity and give everyone in this country a good life. Mm -hmm. And the, these issues are not partisan. So uh, if you go out and explain to the people what we stand for, our issues are not even Republican issues. Mm -hmm. uh, they were codified in the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Before that, the American settlers, starting at Plymouth Rock, uh, developed these. And in fact, they're in books going back to antiquity. They're in mm. the Bible. Mm. The best way for men and women to live together has been known for thousands of years. <laughs> and uh, we're just representing those values. Mm -hmm. And when you take those values into the, into the electorate and talk about them, it doesn't matter what party they're in. Mm. We just had an election down in Josephine County where we won four to one. How did that happen? Uh, the, the issues were explained to the voters in a way that they understood. Mm -hmm. What was the issue that you, The I issue there was, was issue. government overreach. The county commissioners were trying to put in a, uh, a bureaucrat who would have search and seizure powers over the whole county. He could go around, he could knock on your door and demand to see whether you fixed your plumbing without a permit, this kind of stuff. Heavy fines, the fines going to pay the people who were assessing the fines. It's, it's just a really... Uh, draconian government overreach, but it has come to some counties. Mm -hmm. And our county didn't want it, but they didn't know it. <laughs> so we took the issues out and explained it to them carefully. And Josephine County has 42% Republican, mm -hmm. but we got 79% of the vote. Hmm. Because the issue of human freedom, uh, the desire to be free, to be your own man, to be free, to do what you want to do in life as mm -hmm. long as you don't encroach on your neighbor, that's built into everybody. Hmm. <laughs> so when the voter visualized that hearing officer knocking on their door and demanding entrance into their living room, they didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other thing that I was kind of interested in our conversation was, you know, I've run for office too before and, and, uh, and knowing politics as I've known politics, it can get very dirty. Yes. And you made mention about the fact that DeFazio <laughs> has kind of, uh, you know, he basically, because he's been in there for quite some time. He, he, 25 years. 25 years yeah. in that deal aspect of it. And, um, and, and so, anyway, there, there were some things that happened, because uh, I noticed I, I saw you on um, MSNBC oh, yeah. with Maddow. Uh, uh, yeah. And, um, and uh, would you mind sharing some of the things that uh, well, they, you experienced? Let's put it way. The opposition, you see, it's, it, with good, solid American values, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, constitutionalist, the question is what your values are and what you will do if elected. Mm -hmm. Those values, you communicate, it's our job, if we represent them, to communicate them to the voters so that they will decide that we should represent them. Uh, it's the other side's job to keep us from communicating. And the way they do it is by not telling the truth. So... Uh, I'm astonished. There's a uh, sort of straw man in our district, and he walks around the district. He's a terrible person. He has all kinds of horrible characteristics. And his name is Art Robinson. He has the same name as me. <laughs> <laughs> He's a creation of Mr. DeFazio's, uh -huh. you see. And they, uh, they tell a lot of tales they shouldn't tell. Mm -hmm. You have to have kind of a thick skin to run for office in this country. Yes, very much so. so yeah, very uh, much so. I, uh, it would be humorous, actually, uh, humorous what they do, except that it's so important, it's so serious, because it, when they do the wrong thing, our people become less prosperous, mm -hmm. they have less, fewer opportunities in life, it's harmful to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, here, my family decided to work on this because we saw real problems in our country, mm -hmm. and we didn't want these problems to get worse. 
And yet, look at us. We're, we have all the advantages. We have these doctoral educations. We're scientists. We're the kind of people you'd think would be able to do do good things. Mm -hmm. Yet, every turn around, time we turn around, we can't do what we need to do. Our medical research is impeded. All kinds of things are impeded because there's too much government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'd like to. We decided we wanted to help a little bit. That's why we did it. Not because we just happened to run into this guy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Pardon me, but because. Uh, the government overreach mm -hmm. uh, has gotten so bad that productive people can't accomplish the things that they would, mm -hmm. and that hurts us all. Mm -hmm. You know, again, again, uh, and I'm not trying. I'm not trying to quote just jump on Defazio just over and over and over. But the bottom line is that uh, uh, it, it's <coughs> many folks who might be looking at getting into politics yeah. need to kind of get a feel for what you'll be going in regards to an incumbent. Yeah, but right? you Who see, some of the examples. If, if these things, this is worth doing. Yes. But the the people who have been taking away our freedom and costing us our prosperity. And see, the, there are many, many people are suffering in this country. Yes. And I know we can help them. Mm -hmm. But to help them, we have to get these uh, overpaid bureaucrats and politicians mm -hmm. off their backs. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, uh, this is not a good thing they've done to us. They're not nice people in mm -hmm. what they've done to us. So when you go up against them and try to get them out of office, you can't expect to be treated with kid gloves, mm -hmm. and you're not. Mm -hmm. Because you're talking, because you know, a lot of times people would, would always make the reference, if you will, mm -hmm. a government of the people, by the people, right. and for the people. What do right. you think we are from one to ten? Where are we there? If ten oh. say we are definitely a government of the people, by the people, we've, we've, one to ten, what do you think? We've what, lost what, what two, we we've lost two thirds of that at this point. Two thirds. I'd say we've lost two thirds of it at this point, and we're in danger of losing, losing the rest. Mm -hmm. Do you see, take our public lands. Uh, government, uh, Oregon is rich in natural resources, mm -hmm. forests, minerals, everything, water, uh, rich, uh, richer than Switzerland, and yet the Swiss people are three times as wealthy per capita. And this is because our people are deprived of the use of these resources. They speak of government land. No, that's public land. Mm -hmm. It's public land. It should be used by the public. It should be regulated so that we don't harm the land and harm the resources, but they've got to thinking it's government land, and the government uh, bureaucrats and the government people come and tell the people they can't use their land, mm -hmm. and that of course has made Oregon poorer. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, you may not be a farmer, but if it's harder for a farmer to farm, you're paying for it mm -hmm. with higher food prices. Mm -hmm. now, you may not be a miner, but if that miner can't mine, we have to buy those minerals from some other country, mm -hmm. and you become poorer because mm -hmm. our country has to spend money in this odd way. Mm -hmm. So uh, government overreach is harming our schools, it's harming our industries, driven lots of our industries abroad, it's harmed our energy industry so that energy is cheaper in other countries and our, our industries move there. Uh, two ways to put it, one, we can diminish the government overreach and get our freedom back, and the other is if we apply good principles, we can help. And people must understand that, that these are complicated things, but we, men and women have known for thousands of years that living a free life is better for everyone, when everyone is free. And these, uh, if we can live in freedom, we can help the people. We understand the people's pain. We understand what people are going through in this country. And it's terrible for, actually, it's terrible for the lower 90% mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Americans. And we can help, but we need to be free to do so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can't, we're not free of these bureaucrats and these, uh, uh, these institutions that the career politicians seeking their own self-interests have created. They've got to be only Republicans, right? Oh, uh, <laughs> the... the People from all, career politicians from all parties are involved in this thing. Uh, Cross the line. Yes, there tends to be more of the big government people in the Democrat Party, but there are some fine people in the Democrat Party and there are some scoundrels in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I say that as chairman of the Republican I Party. You, I get you. So it isn't a question of party, it's a question of principle. And when a party puts up a first rate man or woman who believes in human freedom, feels the people's pain, wants to help them, that person should be supported. And when they put up some guy who's uh, in it for himself, and he's going to go into office and 
to see how much uh, power and money he can amass for himself, mm -hmm. that career politician, mm -hmm. you should vote against him regardless of what party right. he's in. Yeah. On that particular note, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with, with Art. <laughs> and in fact, we might even open up the lines, okay? We'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks, to the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. My guest today is a gentleman by the name of Mr. Art Robinson, uh, who's chairman of the Republican Party of Oregon. Okay, we've had quite a conversation. For those of you who, who missed the first half of the show, you can do the repeat back on Tuesday and, and then that following Friday. You're very familiar with the, with the format here. Okay, so we're just going to get right back to Mr. Robinson. Art, how you doing again? Okay. Fantastic. You know, we've gone, we've gone through, quote, Who's Art Wright Robertson? Yeah. Uh, his uh, his research in terms of his employer. Uh, we've gone through homeschool, the family, et cetera, et cetera. And then we got back into basically uh, the government of the people, by the people, for the people. And we did noted that, that two thirds of that was gone. So we were sitting up there with You asked me my estimate. Yeah, your estimate, yeah. which is good. I, I, think that, I think you're right on, okay? Yeah. And I think, you're, I think the majority of the people that are out there would probably share that with you. Uh, now, let, let's get into this arena now. Okay, you've run for office. First off, real quickly, are you going to be running again? Oh, yeah. Yes. You going to run again? Okay. Well, he's still there. Okay, I got you. I got you. you know, when, when we, were, when <laughs> we, we have it to do. I heard that. When we were talking about that, were there any specific platform issues that you were bringing to the table when you were talking to him? And well, uh, yes, quite okay. a few. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, our schools, as we met, we've talked about right, that. Right, right. They need local control. Right, okay. We have a lot of idealistic teachers, uh, great opportunities okay. in the school. Okay. But the government overreach is killing them. Right, okay. And Mr. DeFazio has voted against every effort to change that because he gets support from the public uh, unions at mm -hmm. election time, mm -hmm. and the unions don't want to change. Mm -hmm. The unions are not made up in majority of teachers, the education mm -hmm. unions. Mm -hmm. They're made up of all the people that have their hand out for money that mm -hmm. doesn't teach. Mm -hmm. So Mr. DeFazio and I differ because he wants to keep things the way they are and I want our schools to go back to the quality they were mm -hmm. under local control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in uh, other issues, interestingly, uh, I advocate more payment in Social Security than he does. Uh, the Social Security payments have fallen behind. Now, Social Security has been badly handled. The government has really defrauded the people. They spent money that, that didn't belong to them, and they've gotten the prog program into trouble. But I advocate that the people that they receive more money so that they can catch up with what they were promised. Mm -hmm. And then that the program also be altered so it doesn't fall behind in the future. Mm -hmm. And we differ on that. He likes the program the way it is, but it's going broke. I mean, mm -hmm. that doesn't uh, fix it. Um, we uh, are greatly different on the uh, regulatory and tax structure. Uh, when you tax a dollar away from an American, you take that capital out of the economy and give it to a bureaucrat or the, someone who has chosen the bureaucrat. There are many things the government does, and it needs money. Mm -hmm. But if you do too much of it, mm -hmm. you kill the private sector. Mm -hmm. And in regulation, it's the same way. Oregon has some of the highest regulations and taxes in the United States. Mm -hmm. And 
the politicians, the career politicians, will tell you, oh, this is, we're taking care of you. We're preventing bad things with the regulations, and we're getting this money so we can help you. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the special interests that they empower pocket most of the money, and uh, we're just left with less resources in our private sector mm -hmm. to create jobs and, and give true prosperity. Mm -hmm. There was a, a famous uh, economist named Julian Simon. His life's work showed that people always produce more than they consume. That a, that a civilization, a society, always produces more than it consumes and becomes richer with time if the people are free to do so. Mm -hmm. But if you put too much government on their backs, they aren't free to do so and they become poorer. Mm -hmm. And that's happening to us. That's why there's so much debt in our economy. People can't make it and they have to borrow in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And this is a bad thing and uh, we're getting greater and greater debts because of this. Mm -hmm. Mr. DeFazio represents the, uh, those who want to grow the government bigger and bigger. And that just benefits the career politicians like him, he's been in office 25 years, and the special interests who pay for their re-elections. Mm -hmm. They me, don't help the people. Uh, DeFazio, if you don't mind, uh, when you were running, I'm sure you, you've done the, uh, some, some vetting, if you will. What was his background? Uh, well, he what, doesn't what he have do? much of a background except politics. He went to college. He got a degree in gerontology but never used it. He went immediately into politics and worked for a congressman, Weaver. Mm -hmm. And then Weaver left the seat and he took it over. So, so DeFazio, no, DeFazio has no, no, in the private he, sector, he basically has no experience except as a career politician. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. And that's not a good thing. No. Uh, no it's not you a good want thing. people. Uh, when our family looked at the situation, we're lucky. We're blessed. We have these educations. We have the interesting science to do. We could probably live our lives uh, pretty well, even though things are decaying around us. Mm -hmm. But we see what's happening to our fellow Too Americans and what's happening to our nation. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we felt we couldn't remain mm -hmm. silent. We had to work on it. And more and more this is happening. People are coming out of private life that were never in politics. Mm -hmm. And in a way, they're better because they, uh, they aren't career people. They don't want, I, I put it this way sometimes, I couldn't lose that election. Mm -hmm. If I won, I got to go to Washington and try to help fix things. If I lost, I didn't have to go to Washington. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, at least got, but at least you had good but, staff. But, to, good staff. You but got, to a guy like DeFazio, yes, right. his whole life is in Washington mm -hmm. because the money and power there is mm -hmm. what keeps him going. That's mm -hmm. all he's done in life. Mm -hmm. He has no practical experience in life, just money and power in Washington. Well, you know, on that same note, now, now let's get right into this other issue. Now, now here, here you are. You've run twice, mm -hmm. and you did fairly well. You did real well, for that matter. And now you're still interested in going back to the table and facing this guy off at the same time. But during that interim, uh, also, you're now the, the chair of the state Republican Party. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. there's been all sorts of, i.e., quote, what is, where is the state Republican well, they, Party of the state of Oregon? They, they, How'd you get in that deal? Well, and, and why uh, would you do that? I, maybe I say I went the wrong meeting, but that okay. isn't true. <laughs> uh, the state party needed a new chairman, mm -hmm. and they were going to elect one. And quite a few people asked if they could nominate me. And I said, well, my family thought about it. And we said, there's something else to do. How can we do this? <laughs> and then we thought, yeah, but we could do some good. We're trying in the contest with Mr. DeFazio to elect one better congressman. Mm -hmm. But as chairman of the state party, I can be involved in the election of hundreds of better people to office. So it was an opportunity we couldn't say no to. And they needed someone and did not have anyone uh, of comparable ability running for the office. Mm -hmm. So we took it on. And it's a very interesting experience. I can say I'm still in Will Rogers mode. I haven't mm -hmm. met a single person in the party I don't like. <laughs> I've some, met some I think are misguided, but yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, that's not the same thing. Okay. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful experience, but it's also a challenge. And you can understand it's a challenge because the Republicans, although their principles are good, have been generally losing elections in Oregon. Mm -hmm. and so we have to figure out how to change that. And we're, I think we're, we're, going to, um, we're going to do a lot of good. I don't don't know how much. Mm -hmm. We'll know that in 2014. Well, you know, you're right on from the standpoint of being elected around the state because I think the last 
the less effective person in terms of running mm -hmm. a a statewide race was former Governor Vic Atia. Mm -hmm. well, well liked, well respectful, yeah. uh, kind of a guy, and very fine, uh, very, 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 very fine man. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but you know, there are a lot of men like that among us. And a lot and women. Uh, yes, men and women. Right, right. There are a lot of men and women. Uh, not to take away from Governor Atia, right. but there are many, many Americans, uh, good men and women, that we could uh, that we could elect to office. My friend Scott Carpenter died recently. He was an astronaut. A very famous astronaut, he was a second man in orbit. Scott uh, valued what he thought of as can do Americans. Mm -hmm. Americans could do mm -hmm. uh, things, and he was, and he, he did some remarkable things in, in the space program. And I sometimes put it, uh, I, I talk about American wild cards. If you look back at American history, it seems like every time our country gets in trouble, some people come out of the woodwork and fix it. Yeah. And the question is why? Right. And I know why, because in a free, true, con true free country with true liberty, every card in the deck's a wild card. Everybody mm -hmm. can be this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, Scott was especially famous because he was the second man in orbit, and on the second round the Earth, uh, the attitude control system in his spacecraft failed. Mm -hmm. And he had to fly that thing back into the ocean by looking out the window and adjusting things by eye <laughs> with his hands. But uh, uh, it took, uh, it took uh, uh, liberty created the engineers that built the thing. Liberty brought them together, and liberty made it possible for do these things. And you know the average age of the engineer in the space program was 26 years? We went to the moon with 26-year-old engineers. On 26. Average, 26. And these uh, young people uh, were free. And because they were free, they were able to do these things. And Scott Carpenter was just another free man there in the right place at the right time, and he did what people do. Hmm. He did what was necessary. Hmm. And this is, we can all do what is necessary. Whether it's in our private lives, you know, we worry about our children, we worry about our mortgages, we worry about these things. We can all rise to the occasion in our place and do what is necessary, unless we are prevented from doing that. And that's what government overreach is doing to us. Mm -hmm. That's why we must elect more people who understand American liberty, because every time one of our wild card cards turns around and says, I can fix it, a bureaucrat stands there and says, no, you can't. Fill mm -hmm. out this form, please. Mm -hmm. And then another form. And then he taxes him. And then he regulates him. Mm -hmm. And the wild card, the can-do American, is still standing there saying, I want to fix it. Mm -hmm. And the government is saying, no. Mm -hmm. And this is harmful to all of us. Mm -hmm. All of us. Mm -hmm. And that's what needs to change. You know, another interesting point, discussion we had was... Uh, was your your views and your your feelings and and your definition of the so-called outreach? I mean, the, mm -hmm. the Republican Party was being told uh, from a national perspective yes. that they had to outreach to Hispanics, and blacks, and mm -hmm. women, and yeah. the like. Uh, you responded. How did you? I don't. Respond? I don't like those terms. Okay. Uh, uh, you can use. You're right, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and they create outreach programs. Mm -hmm. What does this mean? Man comes into your community. He's a little different. And he says, I'm the outreach person to your community. Mm -hmm. What does he really mean? I'm downreach. I'm, you know, I'm here to, we're, we're going to condescend to talk with you. Mm -hmm. This is nonsense. Go to the grocery store and look around. Do you know how different people are? Just look at them. They're shot, short, tall, fat, <laughs> thin. They have all kinds of characteristics. Look at how different human beings are. Those are all genetic characteristics. The color of their skin, for example, is such a minor characteristic among all the changes that it's irrelevant. And yet these people have subdivided Americans. I don't like those subdivisions. I don't think it's a good idea for the Republican Party or anybody else to say, oh, I must reach out to the African Americans. I must reach out to the Hispanics. Nonsense. All I see is Americans. I see Americans and I see visitors to America. That's what we have in our country. And we have human beings and they're all different. And the genetic differences are enormous. And if you want to talk about skin color, it's one of the most minor genetic differences. And yet, 
what happens is those who want power over Americans, those who want power and money, the bureaucrats and politicians who really wish us ill to their own benefit, they divide us. They try to divide us. They create divisions. There's the division for race. There's a, they call it race. Uh, it's just genetic difference. Uh, there's a division on sex. There's a division on this, a division on that. They create divisions. They make America into a population of minorities, and then people get in and, and lead the minorities against one another. This is nonsense. Mm -hmm. We're all Americans. And if you want to talk about genetic differences, the differences that we disregard are huge compared to the differences that they, we allow them to divide ourselves with. Mm -hmm. So you and I talked about this in, mm -hmm. in, in uh, guiding the Republican Party, and you're playing an important part in, Mon in, well, in the state now, it was in Multnomah County, and the part you're playing in the state, I said, and you agreed, mm -hmm. we're not going to reach out to African Americans or Hispanics. We're going out to reach to all Americans because we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just is not good for our people or productive to try to look around and find differences between us by which we can classify ourselves. Mm -hmm. Just just craziness. Mm -hmm. When I look at, I go shopping sometimes in, uh, late at night in Medford because we buy our food over there. There's a food for less, pretty cheap, and I'll fill my Suburban with food. We have a lot of people to eat at our house. <laughs> and uh, often uh, the Hispanics are shopping in there. And they'll be, firstly, they're very family oriented. You see three generations shopping mm -hmm, together. Mm -hmm. When I look at those people, I think, you know, that's a, that's a hard, very hard working looking man there. I'd like to have him working with me. Mm -hmm. I look at them for the characteristics that they show that are productive. I see the mother bustling around there working with her children. I see a couple of men that look like they could do a really good day's work. And I couldn't care less where they came from. Mm -hmm. It is important to obey the immigration laws, and we mm -hmm. have a debate about that, mm -hmm. but that separating Americans by uh, characteristics, mm -hmm. uh, genetic characteristics, for political purposes or any other purpose is just counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So I don't, when I walk into a room, you can see what I am, mm -hmm. and you can see what you are. Mm -hmm. um, but I had an experience, uh, if I can take the time, we had this issue in Josephine County. Okay. And I went to a meeting, and as I walked in, a nice lady says, Art, watch out for him, he's not one of us. <laughs> and I looked over, and a little counterculture guy walking in, good looking man, but he had a little ponytail, you know, mm -hmm. a little different. So I gave my talk about things, and then I said, you know, I've lived in Josephine County 33 years, and there are a lot of people here that are different from me. When I see one of those people, I'm glad they're there, because if they're free to do what they want, I'm free to do what I want. Mm. And then I pointed to this man that she pointed out in the front row, and I said, this man here, for example, I'm sure he didn't vote for me. You know what he said? I will next time. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what he wanted. Huh. You understand? I understand. And that uh, that that shows he and I couldn't be diff more right. different culturally. Right, right, right. But where it counted, we're the same. Right. Hey, Art, I'll tell you what. Now, again, I've given you the opportunity to meet this man. I, I met him via Jeff Mapes. Thanks to Jeff Mapes <laughs> and the Oregonian. You're yeah, great. Jeff Mapes. I appreciate oh, that. <laughs> boy, I, tell, I like Jeff Mapes. I tell you, I Thank only you, Jeff. hope. Thank you very much, Jeff. But I would also <laughs> like to see whether or not you might entertain the idea of doing a similar article like you did on Art, who happens to be a Republican, on Frank, who I know. Frank, who happens to be a Democrat, and he's the chair. He's the chair uh, of the Democratic Jeff, Party. Democratic yeah. Party, and I've had Frank on the show before. Uh -huh. But I'd like for Jeff maybe to do a, do a piece on him, mm -hmm. and then maybe I can interview him. And maybe maybe I get both of you guys to come well, out Well, that'd be debate. great. Maybe I could convert him to vote for our candidate. Well, that'd be a great you deal. Know, I could explain to him why it'd be better for him. Well, we'll attain that deal. We'll let Jeff <laughs> initiate it to begin with, right? <laughs> okay, we'll I'll get do Jeff it. do that. I'd well, love to have him be on with him. I, uh, good. i tell you what. We have a few minutes. i tell you what. Let's see if we can open up the line and see if we might be able to get a couple of calls here. And see what you thought about the interview that I've just done with uh, uh, with Art here. And, uh, you know, you never know. There might be someone out there that might want to say hi to you. Okay, okay is that okay we'll with see. you? Sure, okay. whatever you want so, to do. So tell me, while we're waiting for a caller or something of this nature, so where do you go from here? What, what are you going to be saying to those folks? Again, I'm, I'm thinking about the party now, yeah. the Republican Party. Folks who have got, I've, I've, uh, they've identified themselves as independents or libertarians or 
you know, on and on and on. How do you bring them all under the same roof again to talk about some of the issues? I don't you're think they'll come under the same roof. Okay, all right. Uh, they're all Americans. Okay. They all share the same values. As I mentioned, these values are timeless. They're thousands of years old. Freedom, liberty, the things which were sort of codified in our, mm -hmm. in our founding documents, the founding fathers, these are built into human nature. In fact, that's the genetic wow. that we have in common. So you're, even in, you're inviting Democrats too, regardless. Who are, are you? Uh, well, of course. I'm not inviting them. They're already there. Right, okay. And uh, the genetic similarities we have, which mm -hmm. cause us all to want mm -hmm. freedom, right. to be free, to enjoy our lives, the blessing of our lives, that's what we have in common. The Republican Party is a tool that can be used politically mm -hmm. to help everyone understand that. Mm -hmm. But we want everybody's vote. Oh, good. I like that. Looks like we've got a caller. Calling you on the air. Your question or comment, please. Yeah, yes, yes I, was, I was calling you about how amazing it was to hear from Art Robinson. What, what was that again now? To listen to Art Robinson. Okay, good. Speaking Thank common sense to the folks of this country. Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate that need, very much. Thank you very much. Is there a we question? We need a great deal more of that. Would you like to have a question? Would you, would you like to have? A, would you like to ask him a question or anything? I would just like to know how we could get his dialogue and his educational abilities with his children spread throughout our state. Okay, well, I appreciate that. We're doing. Thank every, you very much, Carla. He and I are both plagiarizing. Okay. He used common sense. I wrote a book, Common Sense, in 2012, oh, expressing right? these values. And, of course, we both stole it from Thomas Paine. Okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, those values he's talking about, he mm -hmm. just said spread within our state. Right. They are spread within our state. But we have to make people realize it. Mm -hmm. They have to understand mm -hmm. uh, that these are the values we need to follow in our political process. Mm -hmm. They're already in everyone's heart. Mm -hmm. It's all built in. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is awaken them mm -hmm. in all the voters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a question of our having something special we can teach them. Mm -hmm. They've already got it. But we haven't been doing a good job of, of helping them recognize that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you hear this, too, you know, this, 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 this desire, if you will, the, this, uh, you know, I, I want to come out and be a part of. And that's yeah. what this American dream was all sure. about to begin with, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and because of this caller that we just had here, there are many other folks that are out there, but they've basically been put in the closet. And now they may be coming out. Well, they are. Okay. And even within the Republican Party, uh, politicians like to classify people. And there was a very fine speaker, Russ Walker, at a recent ta uh, dinner we had. And he uh, pointed out that uh, in t 10 years ago, polls showed that 15% of the Republicans themselves identified as pro-liberty uh, 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 voters. Mm -hmm. Now it's 41%. And uh, this is uh, uh, not not to try to explain the things on too high a level. When we when we in Josephine County, we got the voters to visualize what it would be like to have that overreaching bureaucrat demanding entrance to their homes. Mm -hmm. This was a liberty issue. This was mm -hmm. a government overreach issue. But the voter understood it viscerally. He didn't have to have it explained to him. He visualized that guy demanding to come in and see if he fixed his own plumbing without a permit. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. by golly, he knew what he thought about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, for the benefit of the viewer, you know, the definition of pro-liberty as it's being laid out. Just I, means I, know, it, I know Jeff Walker. I know Walker. It's, it's, just, uh, Freedom Works. It's, it's just the principle okay. that each of us, uh, life is a fantastic blessing, a wonderful blessing. Each of us has the human right to enjoy our lives with the maximum amount of freedom, as long as we don't encroach on the freedom of someone else to do the same. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that government does is to referee when we get in each other's way. Mm -hmm. So if you have a local government, for example, and you're running your house a certain way, you know, and you, mm -hmm. you're living your life near in your home, if it starts to encroach on your neighbor's freedom, then the local government come in and say, hey, you two guys have to get along. Let's see mm -hmm. what compromise we can mm -hmm. make. And we have some laws. But to the greatest extent possible, uh, we should have the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, property, the things that are necessary to enjoy the wonderful lives that we've been given. Mm -hmm. And we must be sure that our government 
doesn't get in the way of that freedom. Mm -hmm. And our problem is that that's what it's been doing. Mm -hmm. Again, we just got about two minutes or so, but again, for the benefit of those individuals that are out there that might be, might be really upfront, honest kind of mm -hmm. people, American that wants to run for office. Yeah. But in many cases, the, the media is sort of like the wall there. What do, you, what do you say to media? I want you to educate the media for a moment. What do you say to media about well, getting I, them involved in this process? Well, the media, of course, their responsibility is to represent all the people in the public sector uh, accurately. Right. And we hope that they will do so. Sometimes mm -hmm. they become more interested in a particular politics, and they shouldn't. They should be unbiased. But to the people in general, I say run for office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The guys we have in office, the career politicians we have in office, have not been doing a good job for us. And the more ordinary people uh, stand up and say, I'll do this job for a while. Do you know, in the first hundred years of our country, the average congressman served only two years. They were citizen volunteers. None of them thought of personal gain from office. We need to go back to that. Hmm. And I'm urging people throughout the Republican Party to run for office. Whether they want, in fact, I prefer that they not want careers. Mm -hmm. I want outstanding people. And that doesn't mean somebody that everybody knows. It can be someone who's quiet. Mm -hmm. But uh, the more the American people step forward and take the political process into their own hands and run for office themselves, the closer we will come to returning to our basic values. Mm -hmm. So maybe you, you're thinking about the possibility of redefining, if you will, uh, as far as... Uh, uh, Term limits and whatever. Is well, uh, yeah, people talk about term limits, and given that these guys are serving like DeFazio 25 years, yeah, and right, the average right. is 12, it's hard to oppose per term limits. Mm -hmm. They're just there too long. Mm -hmm. The longer they're there, the more they serve their careers and not us. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have the ability to term limit them ourselves. Mm -hmm. Every two years, we get a shot at them mm -hmm. in Congress, and every six years at a senator. Mm -hmm. Why should we have Merkley care? Or right. Or why should we have Wyden care or DeFazio care? Why can't we go down and choose our own doctor? Interesting. We don't need DeFazio care. Well, you know, it's interesting how you, well, you're making that statement because everybody was kind of like making the point about Obamacare. And well, you know, he's getting all the blame. And he, of course, would like the credit. But these ideas about enslaving peoples in medical care have been around for decades. Okay. All right. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank it's you very, very much for being be on your program. program. Thank you. Hey, folks, there's Art Robinson. I'm looking to see Frank from the Democratic Party here very shortly. Maybe I'll get these guys together. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. Take care, I'm folks. On. Sounds great. Have a good one, folks. I'll see you next week with another interesting guest.